Welcome to season four of the Echo Podcast, and today I get the, the privilege of introducing you to two really good friends of mine. Uh, one is a student that I work with at Southern, the other is actually my student worker, but he's been a friend of mine for years. And so the first is Ethan Wu. Ethan is a computer science major at Southern, um, and he is one of the best Cajon players I have ever uh, met and seen. He is incredible. And then John Daniel, who's been a friend of mine since about the summer of 2014, and he's getting his master's in mental health counseling over at Southern Adventist University. And so I'm excited to, to have them on and, and for you to hear what they have to share. And so we're gonna jump right into it. Thanks for watching. This episode of the Echo Podcast is sponsored by Southern Adventist University. So one of the things that the three of us have in common is that all three of us grew up Adventist. And there is, I think, a real growing need and a growing opportunity at the same time for people to start sharing their stories about like, you know, actually growing up Adventist and the reason it's so important and why it's a growing need is simply because right now we live in a time where, where other stories are more accessible. So if you grew up in a small town or you grew up kind of in a, in a bubble, which Adventism is really kind of known for our, our bubbles here and there. Um, we now live in a time where, information from outside of your own bubble is more readily available and accessible. And so there are a lot of people that that have grown up in any faith tradition, regardless of whether it's Adventism, right? Um, who may think like, am I the only one who's had this experience? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? Right? So what I'm hoping to do today between the three of us is talk about our own experiences, kind of growing up Adventist, what, what life was like for us, whether that's family dynamics or school or, you know, whatever. And I don't think the three of us are obviously encompass every single Adventist ever. But what I hope is that there's someone that can resonate with something, some key thread uh, or common thread between the three of us or just different aspects of our stories. So um, today is very much just an opportunity basically for the listener to hear three guys talk about themselves for 30 minutes. So we're going to have a good time. Um, so I will start a little bit. And so I guess we'll do this in a couple phases. Um, the first phase, I guess, will be kind of childhood, what, what actually growing up is like. And the reason I'll go first is it's called, it's a podcasting technique called stalling. Um, and that is where I give you time <laughs> to think about uh, your own. But so for me, I actually did not realize the significance of the family I grew up in actually until a few years ago. Um, it like, it didn't, it didn't like land. And so here's what I mean. So I, I was born and raised Seventh-day Adventist and throughout the nineties, my mom was the executive secretary of a conference. And as a child, I, that, that means nothing to me. Right. Um, and even before that, uh, my grandfather was a pastor in Cuba and came to America. And the crazy thing there is my grandmother and my mom actually got out of Cuba two weeks before Castro took power, which is wild to think about, right? Mm -hmm. How much thing, how much could be different? Um, but my grandfather and my grandmother were actually instrumental in planning or in planting one of the largest Spanish churches in the North American division. And so I have roots, like very, very embedded roots in church leadership and uh, in Adventist leadership. But as a kid, that was completely all foreign to me. Um, so as a kid, my, my dad ran sound for a church that now, uh, as they built a new building, the sound whole, they, it's more like a sound room now is named after him um, and dedicated to him. But so I grew up going to uh, my dad's church where he did sound. But then as I started going to school, found out all of my friends went to a different church. So my mom, after lots of begging and pleading from my older brother and myself, transferred us to the church that, um, transferred us to the church that all of our friends went to, but my dad stayed at the old church. So church even for me was kind of this split experience where I did, um, where, you know, my mom, my brother, my sister, and myself went to one church and my dad went to another. And then we met up for lunch afterward. But, both of my parents working full time meant that, you know, growing up, I didn't really have family worships every, every night or every morning. Um, and on Saturdays, both of my parents were usually, and this is not at all an indictment against them, but it's just, I feel that, and I feel this urge even now as, as a 27 year old, but, 
Um, Saturdays were nap time after church, especially when my dad had to get there at six in the morning and run sound till 1 PM. Like he was exhausted. Um, so Sabbath was spent with me watching discovery channel or animal planet back when both of those channels had quality programming. Uh, and then as soon as my parents were asleep, that is when I, uh, would change the channel. And then eventually they would wake up because they heard it and they'd come out and uh, I would say, oh, I forgot it was the Sabbath. <laughs> My bad. Oh, shucks. I can't believe I forgot again. Uh, and so my like my connection to Adventism as a as like a core identity, part of my identity really wasn't as strong as I think for others, like people that have been involved in Pathfinders and things like like up until eighth grade. I kid you not. Kid you not. I thought that pathfinders were just people who went out and found paths. <laughs> like I'm not, I was like, I have no idea what this is. I never asked because why, why would I ask? This is way more fun of a narrative. Uh, and I was like, well, didn't we have Lewis and Clark for that? Like, I don't, I don't understand literally like this is eighth grade me going like, I don't know what pathfinders do. And that doesn't sound fun to me at all. If that's what they actually do. So that was kind of an introduction to what my childhood was like. Um, very kind of self-directed and, um, and just kind of uh, on the outskirts of an Adventist identity while having a family that actually had a very strong Adventist identity. So, um, John, what about you? What, what uh, is kind of your early childhood background within Adventism? So there are quite a few differences. Uh, <laughs> That's in my perfect. Story. Um, my parents were both um, first generation. So nobody else in my extended family is Adventist or even really Christian at all. Um, like really um, <laughs> so you know family gatherings there were a lot of moments for my parents you know when we were all together for like thanksgiving oh they pull us away as soon as the sun goes down on friday and we have worship and then we're kind of not a part of everything and then we come back in saturday night when everything comes down or the sun comes down you know and it was just, it was very obvious that there was something different mm. um, in the way that we were doing things. Um, we had all the typical, you know, we had one meal that we always had Friday night, and then we had this worship. It was always lentils, homemade bread, and fruit salad. <laughs> and um, then Sabbath morning, we had um, Eggo waffles and veggie meat. And we, I would make it like a pig in a blanket. What is your I veggie meat of choice? That. Oh, that's so hard. That's such a divisive answer, too. No matter what you say, it's wrong. Yeah. Which is why I settle on fried chicken or Big Frank's. Those fried. are both right. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, there yeah, we go. Right? Out of those two, I would say fried chicken. Okay. Yeah, just, I can respect that. Are you a Linkettes person? No. Or what's no, the no. what's the, what's the the other one? Linkettes. They're, they're, is, ju is it just Linkettes? It's Linkettes I feel like there's another one. There's something else, but they're so bad that no one eats them. Oh, okay. So it's just, so it's just Linkettes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I am a Big Frank's person if I'm going to eat a hot dog. Like that's fair. My yeah. Hot no, dog I, of yeah, no, I love big. I'm so I'm not vegetarian, but I will like destroy big Franks. Oh, like same. if you give me a, pa a can of big Franks, like I'm going to town on that thing. So I, it's a problem. I feel like people who aren't vegetarian eat big Franks more than the people who are Accurate. vegetarian. Cause I'm vegetarian and I'm yeah. like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. It's a break from the norm. Yeah. Okay, cool. So Saturday mornings, breakfast, veggie meat, um, probably more fruit. Yeah. Yeah. They would take the, uh, fruit salad from the night before and blend it up and then my dad would like pour it on his waffles i it sounds disgusting i was but, but really also good. sounds like curiously good like yeah like surprisingly good you put a little bit of peanut butter with that and it's actually really good <laughs> i don't really like fruit but that's that's one way that i would eat it um my father was the pathfinder director for the state of arizona and my mom was our club pathfinder director, oh. so heavily involved. Wasn't in really finding an paths, yeah. <laughs> I went out and found the, all those paths, all of them. You get uh, a badge per per path found. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was one of those like two sash type people. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. Oh, so like the worst of, kind of people. Yeah, terrible, Ooh. a terrible person. <laughs> um, you know, we would go out. Uh, Sabbath afternoon was usually an active time. We lived um, in Yuma, Arizona, which is like super deserty. Um, actually, the set for Tatooine is like just outside of my house. 
like the sand dunes that they used for that oh. set. So if you want to imagine what my hometown looks like, just think of Tatooine. <laughs> That's Star us. Star Wars. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we would go out and, you know, like off-road out in the desert or hike to some place, depending on what time of the year it was. Because, like, in the summertime, it gets to be 120 degrees. Mm-hmm. You don't really hike anywhere. Um, but, you know, my parents were still a you-can-wade-but-you-can't-swim type. Mm. Um, so I would trip in the water a lot and just, oops. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, I fell in. Oh, oh shucks. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. So like, <laughs> there's definitely all this stuff where like, there were all these shoulds and shouldn'ts, and I think because my family was so new to Adventism, and like my mom especially had seen kind of what her life had been before that, she was very much interested in passing, just everything on to her kids like and ironically enough you know i'm the only one who still goes to church so like she was 25 percent successful which is kind of sad but um that honestly sounds kind of typical at this point in life like there's a lot of the the story i get is with a lot of families is usually there's only one or two of the kids if there's if there's several that that kind of stay invested to a certain degree yeah so Gotcha. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, and we're going to come back to some of that, but I do want to mention if you are one of those two sash pathfinders, um, you're not the worst kind of person. Uh, God loves you. Um, and we're just learning to love you. Uh, that's all. Uh, but no, 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 if you are someone who grew up in pathfinders and love pathfinders, like know that you are fully affirmed in that. I'm not mocking pathfinders. I'm telling you generally like specifically what I thought. Um, Ethan's mocking yeah. pathfinders. I'm uh, mocking Pathfinders because I grew up in Pathfinders. So <laughs> okay, so you're actually, I was going to say, you're the, you're the one yeah. at, the, at the table that has the most yeah. ability Not only to, am like, I the worst kind of person who had like a full sash, I also had the drill medals. So I really am oh, the worst kind of person. That just like to me, in the same way that Pathfinder sounds like Finding Path, it just sounds like you have a bunch of little medals with a drill on them. Yeah. Like, Honestly, like a little... the first time I heard about drilling, I they were like, oh, someone, someone, the, the drill down. I'm like, is it like whoever could <laughs> drill through like the most pieces of wood like whoever can drill the most two by fours wins amazing so confused amazing um okay so ethan launch into uh some of your early childhood um so i feel like a lot of my childhood is kind of a mix of both of yours because i'm technically i think a third generation adventist but like a first generation american adventist um because um my mom was born in syria and so she had very strict parents um regarding the religion there Uh, My dad was born in Maryland, but uh, immediately went back to Thailand with his parents because they were missionaries. So they both grew up in very, like, very conservative Adventist homes. So I'm like the first one to be raised in like an American church setting. And so I get the the super strict side and the more just like, oh, it's Sabbath. So I guess we can't do this kind of deal. So like you said, Sabbath afternoons come back. It was nap time. I I either put on... um, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, um, Veggie Tales, all that kind of stuff. My yep. parents would fall asleep, sneak downstairs to the PlayStation, be a little too loud. They'd wake <laughs> up, but I'll be like, "Oh, what? It's not sunset at 3 p.m. Ah, oh, bummer." <laughs> but <laughs> 3 <yeah>. p.m. <laughs> but yeah, um, like a, a lot of my childhood again was just doing stuff because that's how it was always done. Mm. It didn't really feel like a personal like Adventist thing to me. It just felt yeah. like something I'd always done. Mm-hmm. So like even Pathfinders, I didn't feel like a super Adventist thing. It was just like, it's Boy Scouts for people who go to church on Saturday. Mm-hmm. That's all it really felt like to me. Um, yeah, like Friday afternoon was like one set meal. Uh, it was usually just like some soup that my mom would make. It was good, but it was like the same soup every, every Friday night. Um, didn't really have like worships with the family every morning or every evening because my parents worked full time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, my, my childhood is really just kind of like <laughs> picking and perfect, choosing things yeah. from each of you guys. No, 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 that, that, that totally makes sense. Like that experience makes sense. And, and the one, the one big commonality that I'm, I'm hearing here is kind of the do's and don'ts. And that is mm-hmm. something that every, I, I think anyone who grew up Adventist, um, especially from a more religiously conservative household or region would kind of identify with for sure. Like my family being Hispanic, definitely or part Hispanic, definitely like 
you know, plays into that quite a bit. Um, but the other thing is, interestingly enough, the first generation, second generation, third generation kind of talk is definitely a specifically Advent. Like, I've not heard that outside of Adventist mm-hmm. uh, or outside of Adventism. And so um, there's a lot here that that I think the three of us do have different enough stories now that I'm hearing them that, you know, there's a lot of value um, that anyone can get just from, you know, the three of us. So let's shift into teenage years now. Um yeah, I'm still in those. Um, perfect. Oh, um, boy, yeah, me too. <laughs> hey, growing up, growing up is a choice, but growing old is a biological reality. So, all right, you and I'm I are choosing. Teenager. You and I are no, no, no. Growing up is a choice. So, you and I have still chosen to be teenagers. There we go. That's I, what I'm saying. I identify as a 17 year old. That, that could get you in trouble. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> May, it could mainly get you in trouble because we need you to drive at. Oh, you know, true. we work together, so I need you to drive vehicles, and you have to be over twenty-one to do that. So yeah, that's, like the, that's main the main reason it gets you job, in trouble. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> um, like one of the yes, it's basically the reason I hired that's, you. Yeah, that's the only reason that Ryan hired me. Um, so for me, teenage years, um, I was never the Adventist that left the system. Um, so I didn't like. I had rebel years, but I never even thought of them as rebel years. Like the same year that I was SA pastor at Academy. Um, was the same year that I was rolling around town BMXing with friends and like basically vandalizing things and thinking the, and like not at all seeing the disconnect there. I was just like with friends and kind of being poorly influenced. And I eventually did realize that around 16, 17 years old. But by that point, like I had already done so much. Like one of my biggest, honestly, like one of the things that I regret ever doing um, is when I was 14, riding around my neighborhood around Christmas. Um, and I'm like, I'm super ashamed of this. Like, I'm, I do not share this story in pride or anything. Like, I wish I could go back and undo this. Um, but we would ride around town and this was back in, in, um, the days of like emo bands, like My Chemical Mm -hmm. Romance and Mm -hmm. bands like that. And so around 2006, uh, 2007 and, uh, so everyone wore their keys on a carabiner on their, on their side belt loop and, my friend and I would ride around, to, ride around my neighborhood during Christmas, and we would basically ruin people's lawn decorations, um, and that included. <laughs> why are you laughing? We're not, this is not supposed to be a positive story. Um, the we would actually like the the big inflatable ones. Like we would cut those. Like it was, and like fourteen year old me thought nothing of this. Aren't like those things like two hundred fifty. Yeah, no, no. no. Like yeah. the next day, I was at Walmart with my family and saw them like on this big shelf, and I was like, "What have I done?" Um, and of course, fourteen-year-old me isn't going to confess to that, so I didn't. But if I remembered where those houses were, um, I remember a couple of them. But everyone in my neighborhood has basically changed. Mm-hmm. So I, but I would like personally go to their doors with a check and be like, "Here's a hundred dollars. Like, I am sorry." Um, yeah. Or here's one hundred fifty in uh, interest. Um, <laughs> your, your, my debt has accrued interest to you. But like, that's the thing. Like, there was a disconnect between you know, what I was doing outside of church and school and what I was doing in, but even me, I, I wasn't consciously like rebelling. I was just doing whatever was in front of me, basically. Um, the way that I rebelled was actually, um, I was more one of those Jesus over religion people for a while. So I rebelled against the do's and don'ts. Um, and at some point I stopped going to church because I felt like church was harming my spiritual life. Um, except that not going to church ended up harming it more because that just meant I slept in uh, instead of actually going or, or doing anything to replace that time of spirituality. Um, but that was, uh, that was a huge thing. I remember the video Jesus over religion by, um, by Jefferson Bethke, who's now a big kind of off of that video, his entire basically platform and career launched with his wife. Um, but that video was super formative during that time. And, um, but then beyond, once I saw, um, how dangerous that mindset on its own was that was and was experiencing the you know the hurt from that that's when I finally decided to come back around and really kind of re-engage in church for real um, so that's kind of what my high school years looked like for me college was a different story obviously but um, I do now let's uh, let's work this in reverse order so Ethan tell me about your uh, now years so my now years <laughs> <laughs> my now years are my college years um, so um, ever since I've come to Southern, uh, for, for college, um, my spiritual life has changed a lot 
it's definitely gotten stronger, but in a different way than it used to be because back in high school, I was like super involved in the church. Like I would be teaching Sabbath school. I'd be coordinating youth events, all that kind of stuff. And so it kind of felt almost like a job to me. And so, mm. th- uh, there was a disconnect there because I, I found God for myself when I was in high school, but then I kind of lost it because it just felt like something I had to do instead of something I wanted to do. Hmm. But ever since I've come to uh, college, I now realize that my relationship with God is something so much more than what I do because I kind of still worship lead as a job, but it's not, it's not really a job to me because it's, it's something more personal now because what I feel like a lot of Adventists do and what gets drilled into a lot of like young Adventist brains is that Adventism and Christianity is something that only happens on the Sabbath. And that's like a bad mindset because it's supposed to be our daily bread, but people make it like their weekly bread, like only on the Sabbath. So that's a conclusion I came to for mm. myself while I've been here. Cause I mean, like you said, I never had any really like rebellious time like i never did anything crazy i didn't leave the church i didn't like, i'm so excited for john's story to be like so i murdered three people <laughs> um <laughs> yeah like like I, I never left the church i never like left adventism i i like questioned at times like is this really like anything at all like is this just a hoax or mm. is christianity anything yeah. but I, ne- I never really like seriously considered leaving the church but there were times where i was just like it's not sabbath i can do what i want and so like like you would go around destroying people's yeah. lawn decorations my friends and i would go to the mall we do we do dumb stuff like knocking over mannequins and just being yep. like oh look they tripped yeah um yep. did you ever jump over a trash can in the mall i i jumped into a trash can at <laughs> that, the mall. that's yep yep <laughs> you and i are the same yeah um these are normal teenage uh, hijinks yeah. jumped into a trash can um i think my friend put like we went to the the food court and someone got like Panda Express and they like put the food like into the pocket of one of the jackets in the in one of the stores. I don't know why they did that, but that's like the most rebellious stuff we did. We never like that's that's definitely like not allowed. <laughs> that's definitely not. It is it is discouraged. It's strongly it is a preferable a- action to take. We never did so- we never did anything like seriously illegal, but definitely things that should not be done under any context but like i don't know it just kind of i grew up with adventism kind of being like just something i did not really a part of me yeah and so gotcha okay john let's hear uh let's hear it well great different (laughs) in that i did leave the church Mm. um and just religion and believing in god just dropped it all for for a while um my first three years of high school were pretty normal um i had a big car accident i was driving um it was really bad um and sitting in the hospital afterwards i kept hearing people say oh um like it's a miracle that you're all alive and like god did this and it I know that they intended that to be comforting, but it made me really mad. And Mm. I was like, you know, if God was really looking out for us, he could have just, you know, not let my tire pop. Yeah. And, Mm. you know, wouldn't that have been easier for him, you know, (laughs) than savoring everybody? But so I just got mad. And um, like you, I was the SA or ASB, whatever, religious vice president. Student Association, student council, student government. Yeah. Uh, religious vice president at an academy, you know, that year. And so I went from, you know, winning that election, planning mission trips and being Mm. super active to really questioning what I believed to deciding that I didn't believe anything to getting kicked out of academy. Um, and you know, that kind of just taking your whole base of of belief away uh really kind of throws you into somewhat of a depression there's a lot of spiraling Mm. and whereas the two of you had like minorly illegal hijinxes that was not my experience Mm. my 
the things that I did were definitely illegal. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of took me into my, my adult years. Yeah. Uh, no, I, um, no, uh, depression and tragedy certainly follows my story. Um, the only reason I haven't gotten any details, cause I've definitely talked about it several times on this show already. Yeah. Um, you guys wouldn't know that because you don't listen. But now you will. Um, I'm excited for our two newest <laughs> listeners of Echo. Um, no, the uh, the reality is that all three of us at some point had a belief system, whether it was ours or our parents or whatever, and then had to redefine what that faith experience was, right? What that what that identity was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I I think the last question that I want to ask here is um, is just that where are you now? What, what does your faith look like today? Um, and what is one way that you got to that, you know, got to that conclusion? And I don't know that this will be us in five, 10 years in the same way that five, 10 years ago, we didn't know where we would end up. Our faith could look entirely different, more developed. Um, anything could happen really in that time. So right now where you are in your faith, where would you say that you, um, where would you say that you land and how did you get there? Um, so once again, the legendary podcasting technique called stalling, um, for me, one of the, one of the biggest things for me was my senior year when my life went, um, you know, just really kind of fell apart. Uh, had a lot of tragedy happen to my family, a lot of depression. Um, but the most formative statement that from the time I was 17 to, to now, so over the last decade of my life, um, the most formative question or statement that I that I offered myself in the middle of all of that tragedy was, um, if I'm only going to um, praise God or believe in God when things are good, and I'm going to abandon Him when things are bad, then I don't know that it was ever really belief to begin with. Mm-hmm. And that for me was was the time where I decided, like that statement alone was what motivated me to then say, God, all right, I'm going to take you at your word. Like, I'm going to read your Bible. <laughs> um, I'm going to find the places where you say, where you make a promise, where you say you're going to do something, and I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to, I'm going to wait for you to do the things that you've said you're going to do. Um, that, was, that was huge for me. And so ever since then, for me, faith has looked like, um, it, it, it does look a little bit more detached than I think for most people. Um, but basically... I believe that God works in all things for the good of those who love him. That's Romans eight twenty eight. Um, I believe that. And I also believe that God has made each of us with a level of discernment and a level of wisdom. And as we are growing in Christ, both of those things increase, right? So I, my life now less, uh, looks less like me asking for signs and waiting for God to do something to prove something to me. And instead is more me you know, still praying over decisions and things that I do, but ultimately my life now looks like faith steps where I say, God, I'm just going to trust that I'm, you know, here that I'm walking in your will. And if, if I'm not, then I'm going to trust that you're going to correct me. Um, and I do think that God respects us enough to allow us to make those decisions and, and to encourage us to, right? Because I think, uh, for me, one of the big things I've seen is a lot of people will wait for signs or God to do something, um, mainly because they want a scapegoat if everything goes bad. Hmm. So when everything falls apart, then, Oh God, it's your fault. You're the one who called me here. And so that's kind of how I've, how I've tried to model my life. And that was a result of tragedy and me trying to have to figure out everything on my own, um, in my life because I didn't have a father figure now to ask questions to, you know, another parent struggling with things that, uh, took her attention away. So for me, it was, um, It was like, I got to sink or swim here and figure out adult, (laughs) figure out adulting as I go. And that, so my faith right now, I'm in a great place as far as my belief is concerned and my relationship with God. And, and I'm really grateful for how far he's brought me. So that's where I am currently. Um, Ethan, what about you? Um, I definitely say I'm in like a growing stage right now. Um, Like my biggest like beef with God was when I was in my senior year of high school. Like I didn't have any huge tragedies, but I just started like losing all my friends um, I was so overwhelmed because like you all were like essay pastor or stuff like that. I was essay president my senior year. Mm. And so I was super busy with that. I was doing hard classes. I had a bunch of extracurriculars, so I never really had time to spend with friends or even with God. And that's you. Okay. You always have time to spend with God. It's just, I chose not to, because I was occupying myself with all these other things. Mm. And so when I started losing all of my friends, because I couldn't like spend time with them, 
I was, that's when I really started questioning like, God, why are you taking all these things away from me? Uh, if you really love me, why are you taking away all the people that I love? Um, and so that, that was a real struggle. I felt like I, um, left high school with like three or four really good friends and then they all went to other colleges. So when I went to Southern, I was like, okay, God, this is, you're, you're going to have to prove something here. Like if this is really what you want me to do, you're going to have to help me out here. And so, I mean, like, like you said, I stopped praying for signs and just said, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do stuff. And if I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to trust that God's going to either stop me or put me back on the right path. And so ever since then, I've been meeting great people here. I may, I've met like much better people here um, in college, mm. people who help my walk with God and other than hurt it, because a lot of the people I hung out with in high school really were like harmful towards my relationship with God. And so I know I made the right choice following God coming to Southern. Um, trying to think well, where am I going with this um I believe in you yeah <laughs> you got this uh yeah I, I started making my faith less about Adventism and more about Jesus mm. because it's not like the religion I realized that it's not the denomination that's important to me like yeah I believe what Adventists believe that's why I'm an Adventist but that's not the most important thing in my walk with God it's my walk with God is more important than my walk through the Adventist church so I mean even when I don't go to church I'll like spend time with people like going over the Bible. Um, and so I've never read the Bible through, I've had a really bad devotional life. So right now I'm in a point in life where I'm trying to read through the Bible and it's really helping me grow spiritually. Mm. Like I wouldn't say I'm anywhere near like my spiritual goal. Like I'm nowhere near the end of my walk. Um, no one's ever really near. The I was going to say, neither, but none, I mean, like, none of us are. I'm if saying you feel like, like you are. I'm saying like <laughs> I've grown up in the Adventist church for so long, but I'm just now seriously starting my walk with God, mm. making it a personal thing. So that's like where I am, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, we're out of time. So. Good. We'll make time for you, John. <laughs> we'll make time. Um, We've made the time. <laughs> um, I had to go through, um, well, where we left off was me not believing in God. Obviously, mm -hmm. that changed. Um, I studied my way back, spent several years telling myself that I had to clean myself up before I could be good enough to go to church and that's a whole different subject mm. um you know but if if anybody's listening who's in that spot um it's not about you being good enough and if you feel like you need to be in the church go back and that's all i'm gonna say about that right now um but as i studied my way back in i started actually working for the church and um, I got to this place where I had to separate my spirituality from my religion mm. um, so that if something happens inside the church that I don't necessarily like or, you know, something happens that hurts my feelings as mm. far as the religion, it doesn't affect my view of God mm. because the church is made up of imperfect people. Yeah. Right. Like that's the only reason that I'm mm. allowed in. Yeah. Is because there's imperfect people there. And the so church like, was made for imperfect people. Yeah. In the same way that people who are, don't think they're good enough don't want to enter. Like, no, it was right. made for people who don't think they're good enough. Like that's yeah. that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's huge. Yeah. Definitely. So um, like I've I've had to separate those things for myself mm. and that's that's been a big growing experience where you know, something can happen with church politics or, you know, with my job or whatever. And I'm not sitting there like, oh, well, God is a bad person because mm. these people did this thing that I didn't like. Yeah. And so it's a lot more personal to me. Yeah. It's it's not as, as corporate. And it just really, it looks like me trying and failing again and again and again to mm. learn how to walk by faith. Like every time I feel like I've got that figured out, God's like, nope uh, <laughs> try again yeah you know and and that's really what it's looked like mm. for me for the last couple of years no i love it i think um see it's that this is what this is kind of what i've realized it's, it's not jesus over religion or jesus instead of religion because i i think that that jesus tends to work through his church and um i do think there's a level of like just 
just like John, I know you're married. If, if I didn't like your wife or hated your wife, like that would affect my relationship with you. Right. Like that's your wife. Um, and it, the same is true between God and the church, which the Bible refers to as his bride, right? Yeah. Hating the church doesn't really <laughs> go over too well with, uh, with the church's husband. Um, and, and so I, what I think it really is, is understanding that your, the core of your identity is not in the church, but rather it is in Christ, right? Understanding that, um, that the relationship with him is what's really important. Um, and that's the thing that guides you. And, um, church is meant to be a supplement to that, something that, that helps that. But I think for all three of us, it's been, this is something that we've had to own at some point. And it's turned into much, so much more than the do's and don'ts and uh, just the the actions that we take every day. But rather, it's now more about the, even the perspectives that we take. Um, so any final things that you would want to share or say as we close out? Um, one of the huge things for me in getting to this point was... Um, when a certain vote happened mm. um, at a certain conference, just generally speaking, um, <laughs> a certain vote came back in the summer of like 2016. Um, 15. 15. 15. It was one of the two summers that I worked in Hawaii. That's all uh. I need. So um, it made me really unhappy. And I, I was working for the church at that point. And, um, church didn't seem like something that I really wanted to be a part of anymore at that, at that point. Mm. And one of my friends sat me down and he said, look, if everybody who leaves the church, like everybody who disagrees with one aspect of the church leaves the church, how's the church ever going to change? How's it ever yep. going to grow? Like, it's not about everyone in the church needing to agree. Like there needs to be respectful discourse in the church. Mm -hmm. But like, if you leave, that's never going to happen. And so that's something like yeah. that I would encourage others to think about. Like if you're unhappy with the church, don't leave. Yeah. And engage in it. And actually yeah. I think that, uh, that tension is really important because the tension between sides, you know, or, or viewpoints and different perspectives, um, the tension keeps everyone from going so far away, right? That tension keeps people anchored closer to the middle and, um, that's super important. So yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up and for sharing that. Um, so yeah, Thank you guys both for coming on um, and thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, I've learned a bit more about you and I've really enjoyed this. And so um, for our listeners, we do hope that this has been something that you've connected with. I hope that there's something in our stories that you can connect with um, and be sure to check out any of the other Project Refresh shows and, and check out um, more episodes of Echo. But thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time. so much for listening to echo and for being on this journey with us if you're watching on youtube we hope that you'll leave a comment subscribe hit that like button if you're listening on itunes spotify or whatever podcatching app that you like the most we hope that you'll hit that subscribe button that you'll leave a review and that you'll engage with us and also for more content from project refresh that's like echo and some of the other shows that we host then head on over to theprojectrefresh.org thank you so much for your support it means the world to us and we'll see you next week